the elusive and curious nature of the experience, that it's necessary to be in a particular state of consciousness in order to have that experience. And Rick's suggestion, and he did explore this with John Mack, they were just beginning to work on it together when John Mack was tragically killed. By a drunk driver. By a drunk driver. Rick's uh, Rick's suggestion uh, is that UFO abduct the people who have the UFO abduction experience are people who spontaneously overproduce DMT in the brain. That their pineal gland, and let's not forget that the pineal gland is a sense organ, was a, it's called the third eye. In evolutionary older animals like uh, lizards and reptiles, it still actually is sensitive to light. Uh, in human beings, it's gone deeper into the brain, but the suggestion is that it's still a sense organ, which allows us to sense other dimensions, and the lens through which it allows us to do this is the DMT that is produced in the pineal gland. So his suggestion was that all of us produce DMT in our pineal glands, most of us in sub-trance levels, that the UFO abductee is an individual who spontaneously overproduces it, is plunged into this trance-like state, has these experiences, and crucially, crucially, that is not to say that the experiences are not real. So there could be a science behind this, Graham. I believe there's a science behind this. And unfortunately, uh, our society, at least officially, is very reluctant to explore that science, and not only reluctant, but actually condemns it and witch hunts it and, and, and turns it into a criminal act. Uh, and I think we're making a huge mistake uh, by, by doing that because there's a fertile area of inquiry uh, into the nature of reality and into the nature of what we are uh, as beings which we're simply not getting into at the level we should be getting into because of, because of fear and narrowness of mind, and I suspect uh, an, an intention on the part of small groups of powerful individuals to monopolize and control this aspect of human experience, which is a very old and very important aspect of human experience and which has been demonstrated from what happened with the painted caves and that transformation in human behavior about 40,000 years ago, which has been demonstrated, is of fundamental importance to the human race, which set us on the track uh, that, that led to the modern world. And, and in a way, I think what's happening is that we modern humans are in danger of becoming locked once again into rigid and unthinking patterns of behavior just as our ancestors were before they started having visions and creating the paintings on the cave walls, which then opened their minds and made them much broader creatures, we've become, our particular lock-in is to technology, to the mechanical fix, to mechanical advantage. It's very successful, works incredibly well, but we've, we've hoodwinked ourselves into the illusion that that's the only way forward for us. Uh, and we've deliberately, willfully cut off the exploration of consciousness that was so fundamental in the great leap forward of our ancestors. And I'm afraid we're going to get locked again into a rigid and destructive pattern of behavior unless we're prepared to open up to that exploration of consciousness and regard these sacred plants as allies in that exploration rather than as enemies. What does this tell you about all these civilizations, past and present, that seem to say the same thing about what they see when they're in this higher state of consciousness. It, it, it tells us that it's a wonderful mystery to be born as a human being and to be born in a human body, to be a creature that is part spirit and part matter, uh, to, be, to be born into this, this strange and mysterious existence where where to go through it, every moment of it, if we only open ourselves up to it, is an adventure in, in discovery and in, and in self-discovery, where mysteries surround us at, 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 at every corner and where it's our mission uh, to explore mystery rather than to shut ourselves off from mystery. That's what it tells me. It is something. I want to talk with you when we come back about fingerprints of the gods. Absolutely. Where do we get supernatural? Uh, Supernatural is, is available in, in all the shops, and it's available on uh, Amazon.com. Graham Hancock, Supernatural. Controversial when you wrote this? Uh, yes, uh, con it, 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 con con controversial. Um, uh, but, but, but controversial, I think, in a, in a different way from my, from my previous books, um, precisely because it does 
inevitably deal with altered states of consciousness. And this is one of the great taboos, perhaps the last great taboo in our society, the thing that we, that we cannot talk about anymore. The, the, moment you, the moment you start talking about deliberately altering people's state of consciousness, it, it, it raises a huge knee-jerk reaction that's been conditioned into us from birth um, of hostility and anger and puritanism and the feeling that it must somehow be wrong to deliberately alter our consciousness with a plant or or with a substance and and so I found myself surprisingly you know having to defend our right as individuals to explore our own consciousness and this is a controversial issue weirdly I don't understand why it should be controversial but it is it's terribly controversial to say that we as adults have a right to explore our own consciousness in any way we wish so long as we don't get in other people's faces I do believe Jacques Vallée uh, who of course the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind was generated around has also moved into the direction of dimensional. Oh, yes. Yeah. Jacques, Jacques Vallée's work, um, which I cite at length in The Supernatural, is really the most ma majestic and wonderful uh, opening of minds. The Passport to Magonia, written by Jacques Vallée, was the first book to explore the connection between fairies and uh, aliens. And really what I've done in Supernatural, he stopped that in 1969, is I've taken the evidence forward from where Jacques Vallée stopped in 1969 to all the new evidence on UFO abductions and indeed on shamanic uh, experience that has come into the public domain since 1969. But Jacques Vallée's work in this field is absolutely fundamental. He was the guy who made the real breakthrough, who saw that fairies and aliens are not different things, but the same things seen through different framework. The, it, truly remarkable work on his part, and Graham, of course, always with you. The parallels also between supernatural, fingerprints of the gods, also, they run hand in hand. Did your views change at all over the years? Well, no, not really, because I can, I, in, in one area, I found that, the, what, the, my, that my new discoveries while researching Supernatural uh, added to what I had learned uh, going back to the early 1990s and researching fingerprints of the gods. I mean, look at ancient Egypt, you know, look at all the deities of ancient Egypt, whether it's Anubis, whether it's the Sphinx, whether it's Sekhmet, whether it's Sobek, who's got the head of a crocodile and the body of a human being. All of the ancient Egyptian deities are these therianthropes part animal, part human uh, hybrids. And we now know from Rick Strassman's work, from the experiences of shamans, that such encounters are common only in altered states of consciousness. Therefore, the ancient Egyptians, too, were definitely using altered states of consciousness. Up next, some updates from Graham Hancock, Fingerprints of the Gods. Next hour, we'll open up the phone lines with Graham Hancock, but we'll be back as we talk about Fingerprints of the Gods. Almost hard to believe, Graham, sign in the seal when you wrote that about the uh, lost Ark of the Covenant 16 years ago. I know, I know. I, it's really strange. I find myself, I, I find myself really puzzled by that because it just seems like it just seems like yesterday in the course of in the course of my life. You know, during the 70s and uh, and 80s, I'm, I'm getting to be an old boy now. I'm 58 years old. Oh, don't, don't say that because that's how old I am. Well, there we are, George. Another thing in common. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, you know, and and so I, I became a, 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 a journalist after after leaving university in 1973, and and I quickly became very very focused on on Africa and specialized in in Africa. I lived in Somalia for a year. I lived in Kenya as the East Africa correspondent of the Economist. Uh -huh, and in, sure. And, and in that role, I was traveling around the African, the East African region, reporting on, uh, on uh, events and uh, developments there. And my travels took me regularly to Ethiopia, uh, which has a common border with Kenya, just, just north of Kenya, in the Horn of Africa. And uh, because Ethiopia, of course, was very much in the news in the early 1980s with famines and wars and all sorts of terrible things happening. And uh, in the course of my duties as a reporter in the middle of a, a war zone, I was flown in on a DC-3. We had to do a, one of these strange descents where you dive down from high altitude and more or less nosedive into the airfield because the whole city, it was an ancient city called Aksum in northern Ethiopia, was surrounded by rebel forces. 
Um, so flew into Axum in this hair-raising dive on a plane that the day before it was still bloodstained. It had been used to carry wounded from a battlefield. Um, flew in there. The city at that point was still in, in government hands uh, to report on what was happening there. And while I was there, um, I went to the Cathedral of St. Mary of Zion, which stands in the heart of Axum. Axum is a very mysterious place. It's been a Christian city 